Hello, and welcome back to the new Cardiovascular Horizons Digital Education Series. I'd like to thank Dr. Craig Walker and the entire NCDH staff for their hard work in putting together this very important series of lectures. I certainly hope that most of you tuning in will find these very useful for your practices and of uh, good educational value. The topic of this lecture is the role of non-invasive testing in the diagnosis and selection of treatment options for PAD patients. These are my disclosures. Well, vascular testing for PAD starts with diagnosis, case planning, and ends with surveillance once an intervention has taken place. But I can't stress enough understand the basics before even considering any type of testing. Bottom line is know the risks for peripheral arterial disease. An important physical exam on all our patients who have cardio, uh, cardio risk factors, who have known coronary disease is extremely important. Simple screening uh, techniques can be used in the office, ankle brachial index, pulse volume recordings, skin perfusion pressures. But the bottom line is if you don't think about PAD, you won't test for it. Physicians are the best screening tools for PAD or any primary care provider. The, uh, my, my colleagues sometimes uh, get a little bit annoyed with me when I remind them that, you know, atherosclerotic disease is not confined to the coronary arteries. It's a systemic disease, and we need to keep that in mind. In all of our credentials and our diplomas, it says we're specialists in cardiovascular disease. That goes beyond the heart. Remember, roughly 70% of, pa of patients with CAD will have PAD and vice versa. Roughly 70% of patients with PAD will have CAD. And most patients with severe PAD or critical limb ischemia will suffer a cardiovascular death. Symptoms. Well, classic symptoms, claudication, pain or cramping in the muscles upon ambulation, which is relieved with rest, really only occurs in about one third of patients. About a third of patients will have atypical symptoms and about a third of patients will have no symptoms whatsoever, particularly diabetics. The dietists will tell you in a patient with severe diabetes, they can literally do an amputation of a toe without anesthesia because patients don't feel pain. They're often unaware that they even have a wound. So on physical, what are the signs uh, of critical limb ischemia or significant limb ischemia on physical exam? Certainly non-healing wounds, shiny skin, loss of hair growth, cool skin temperature for one limb compared to the other, pale or bluish skin, reduced capillary refill times, pallor on elevation and rubor on dependency. Who should undergo non-invasive testing? Well, certainly anyone age, over the age of 70, age 50 to 69 with a history of diabetes or smoking, or age less than 49 with diabetes and one additional risk factor, including smoking, hypertension, or elevated serum cholesterol. Certainly patients with an abnormal lower extremity pulse exam. Again, things start with a good physical exam. And as I already mentioned, known atherosclerosis of other vascular beds, including the coronary arteries, carotid arteries, and renal arteries. So let's start with the most uh, simple and basic test we can do in the office, and that's the ankle brachial index. Basically, the blood pressure in the ankle divided by the blood pressure in the arm. A normal ABI is typically 1 to 1.1. Less than 1.8.9, mild, 0 0.6 to 0 0.8, moderate disease suggested, 0.4 to 0.6, severe disease suggested, and less than 0 0.4, critical limb ischemia suggested. Be wary, though, of an elevated or normal ABI, particularly in patients who are, are diabetics or have significant kidney disease. These uh, patients typically have very calcified vessels. Calcified vessels will yield a normal uh, elevated ankle brachial index because these vessels are non-compressible. If the exam and clinical presentation, in other words, you suspect a PAD, but they don't correlate with ankle brachial index, Further non-invasive testing is required to confirm the diagnosis. Ankle brachial in indexes may also be, quote, normal in patients with 
uh, inflow disease, specifically the distal aorta or iliac vessels. These patients not infrequently will have a normal ABI at rest, but when you exercise them, will have a substantial drop in their ABI. So again, if you suspect PAD and they have a normal ABI at rest, also follow up with an exercise ABI. ABI. A toe brachial index is not influenced by calcium in the vessel, but again, as long as there's a toe present in which to measure a toe brachial index. Skin perfusion pressure is an also an, a simple a way of evaluating the microcirculatory health. It's a distal arterial test. It uses utilizes laser Doppler to evaluate reactive hyperemia. It measures in millimeters of mercury the pressure at which blood flow first returns to the capillaries following controlled release of occlusion. In other words, a blood pressure cuff around the affected limb. It is a, a very accurate indicator of healing potential and disease severity. As this chart demonstrates, it uh, uh, similar to ABI, greater than uh, an SBP of greater than 50 millimeters of mercury is uh, considered normal. Less than 40 in the range of 40 to 50 correlates with mild disease. 30 to 40, moderately uh, abnormal disease, and less than 30 is likely to be associated with severe peripheral vascular disease. Again, as this graph demonstrates, it correlates very nicely with angle brachial indices. But again, beware in patients with end stage renal disease, diabetes, and particularly if they're on dialysis. Next, let's talk about another simple in, in office test pulse volume waveforms or pulse volume recordings. This was actually developed quite a number of years ago by a gentleman named Raines. He was an MIT student researcher all the way back in 1973. This study was made possible by new advancers in transducer technology with improved sensitivity in detecting arterial pressure pulse change. This uh, study assumes that volume changes in the cuffs placed around very, at various levels around the affected limb by the passage of uh, the pulse wave of blood is proportional to changes in the arterial volume encompassed by the cuff. Pressure sensitive transducers will yield a waveform representative of a true arterial pulse contour. Again, some people uh, mistake uh, PVR tracings as true arterial tracings. They, they're not, although they look similar to an intraarterial waveform, uh, obviously they are not. Normal waveform is associated with a rapid systolic upstroke, a relatively sharp peak, and a reflected wave on the downstroke. Uh, often referred to as a dichrotic notch, as we refer to them in a normal um, arterial uh, waveform uh, measurement. With mildly uh, abnormal, mild disease, uh, the waveform becomes mildly abnormal. There's some broadening, uh, mild rounding of the peak of the curve and loss of the dichrotic notch or reflected wave. Moderately severe disease, further widening and rounding of the waveform with a re significant reduction in the amplitude. And a severe disease, further widening and a great reduction in the amplitude. In fact, it's not unusual in these patients to see a flat line uh, type tracing. Uh, here's an example of a completely normal uh, PVR recording. It also demonstrates the, the level at which the uh, blood pressure cuffs are placed around the leg. And again, as you can see at all levels, there is uh, a normal waveform with the sharp upstroke, uh, sharp peak, sharp uh, rapid downstroke, and a dichrotic notch. So once we've done some simple non-invasive testing in the op office, what are our next options to help confirm the diagnosis of PAD and help guide uh, management. We need to uh, look at duplex ultrasound. We also have the options of contrast arteriography, uh, CT angiography, or uh, magnetic uh, resonance arteriography. Duplex ultrasound, another very inexpensive way to further evaluate patients for peripheral vascular disease. The advantages of ultrasound is that it's simple and cheap. It's non-invasive. There's no contrast administration involved. It's not only great for diagnosis, but also for surveillance. Disadvantages is that it's more qualitative than quantitative. Basically tells us, yes, there is disease, but does, doesn't necessarily tell us the extent of disease uh, and certainly is not sufficient to tell us whether or not uh, any type of uh, intervention, either surgical or endovascular, is uh, 
possible or indicated in that patient. It's also highly technician dependent, especially below the knee where the vessels are very small, particularly if a patient is obese or have, has significant venous insufficiency uh, with very, very large calves. Uh, obese patients as well, particularly in the uh, pelvic and abdominal views, which may uh, be very difficult to see, uh, especially not only from the adipose tissue, but also uh, from uh, uh, obstruction from bowel, bowel gas, uh, et cetera. Uh, there are normal velocities by the duplex ultrasound, which uh, are uh, we can use as guidelines. Uh, as you would suspect, the further away from the heart, the slower the velocity as we get into away from the conduit vessels to the resistance vessels. And as obstruction occurs and the, the severity of obstruction increases, the velocity through the obstructed segment will increase. Same reason the flow of water through a garden hose increases when you stick your thumb over the end of the, of the, end of the hose. The same amount of blood is trying to get through a smaller space. So by definition, in order for that to uh, be accomplished, velocity has to increase. Most uh, studies, both uh, primary studies as well as looking for patients uh, uh, at patients for restenosis who have had an intervention procedure, either use a, a peak systolic velocity increase of 2 or 2.5 as the standard the definition. You'll see this in the literature. Uh, various studies use either 2 or 2.5 as an indicator of significant obstructive disease. Example here of a color flow added to the duplex ultrasound, the art artery in the uh, red and orange and the venous uh, structures in blue. And a follow-up slide here demonstrating what happens. Certainly in the area of obstruction, uh, flow becomes turbulent, it's no longer laminar. And also we see on the, uh, uh, an increase in the uh, velocity of blood flow through the area in question. So, as once we made the diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease, either by our physical exam, in-office testing, or duplex ultrasound, when and why do we uh, move on to CTA or MRA for imaging? I think at this point in your uh, managing that patient, you have to define what is your goal of moving on further. Well, if the diagnosis is still not made or unclear from uh, your, not, your simpler non-invasive study, you may want to proceed with CTA or MRA for imaging. Uh, it's going to be a more accurate assessment of the disease severity, disease location, and extent of disease. Remember, PAD is often multi-level disease. It also allows us to assess uh, collaterals and their source. But largely, we use CTA and MRA for case planning. Uh, we want to decide, is this something that is a surgical case or something that we can manage with endovascular techniques. If we are going to uh, approach that patient with endovascular techniques, uh, where are we going to approach from? Is it going to be femoral, popliteal, pedal, brachial, even these days with longer catheters, radial access? And we can also uh, begin to prepare for the procedure by deciding what kind of devices we might need to use, what kind of wires we're going to use. Are we going to perform atherectomy? What's the degree of calcification? If we intervene, what's uh, the peripheral runoff? Is there a chance for dislimbalization and inclusion of the runoff vessels? Disadvantages of these uh, studies is that uh, of CTA in particular is that it exposes the patient to contrast and radiation. Images with CTA in particular are often obscured by calcium. Uh, calcium artifact can create or obscure lesions, uh, give us pseudo lesions, depending on how we uh, look at the images. If we do plan on an intervention, uh, it requires a repeat contrast exposure. You're now exposing the patients to multiple uh, episodes of uh, contrast, which becomes problematic if you have renal insufficiency or are uh, diabetics, which are many of these patients are. So the way I like to look at it is I'll proceed with an angiogram or intervention as a primary rather than CTA as uh, a diagnostic tool if there's an extremely high likelihood that I'm gonna find disease and uh, proceed with an intervention. The question I ask is why uh, expose that patient to two episodes of contrast? Uh, also, if small vessel disease is suspected, patency may be very difficult to assess, particularly as I already mentioned, if heavy calcium is present. Uh, 
Uh, calcium can obscure or lead to overestimation of stenosis, just as in the larger vessels. If you do suspect small vessel disease, MRA can uh, often be more helpful than CTA. Sorry there. Uh, this is a typical CTA of um, uh, a patient with an abdominal aneurysm. But the reason I put this slide up is to uh, make a couple points very uh, clear about your evaluation of CTA. As you can see in the iliac vessels, there's intense calcification. There's also some spotty calcification in the aorta itself and the aneurysm. With the calcium uh, present, it's really impossible to say, looking at a reconstructed image like this, whether or not there is obstructive disease in those iliac vessels. I think as angiographers, we like to uh, see reconstructive vessels just like we look at angiograms in the heart. Uh, we like to look at angiograms the same way in the, uh, in the legs, see blood flow and uh, the uh, vessels along their long axis. But I think when looking at CTAs, we need to be uh, like re read these studies like radiologists looking at the axial views. As you can see on the frame on the left, we really can't see the degree of obstruction. But if we look at the same level on the cross-cut views, we can see that there's full filling of those vessels with contrast and no obstructive disease. So again, you must learn to read axial cuts if you're going to use CTA as part of your evaluation in these patients. Again, uh, CTA at, at the iliac femoral uh, uh, level, again, difficult to say because of the calcification. Clearly a normal vessel on the uh, right leg and a highly obstructed vessel on the left leg uh, seen on the axial cuts. CTA becomes more difficult to interpret in distal vessels, uh, particularly in diabetics and patients with CKD because these uh, vessels are not only smaller, but often intensely calcified as well. Again, looking at the trifurcation vessels on the axial cuts on the right, uh, giving us more uh, in-depth information than looking at the reconstructed view. Uh, again, another example, level of the uh, axial cuts at the bifurcation, seeing the cross-sectional views, clearly a totally occluded vessel, uh, uh, moving the calcium out of the way on the right side, and also looking at the left, we not only see, uh, we see the vessel patent, but also an aneurysm being present. Again, learn to read the axial cuts. MR angiography, let's move on to that for a few moments, does have advantages uh, as CTA and that it's non-invasive. There's no iodine-based contrast used. There's no radiation exposure to the patients. It is better for small vessel visualization. Sensitivity and specificity, 95 and 97% respectively versus CTA at 91% for both. Disadvantages, at least I found in my practice, is that there's, it's highly technique dependent, uh, giving us both false positives and negatives. Highly reader dependent, again, giving us false positives and negatives. Not all centers have MR, and so many of our patients uh, with uh, uh, cardiac and vascular disease have PACERs, ICDs, and other metallic implants, which may preclude the use of an MR. And gadolinium nephrogenic systemic fibrosis is, is still remains a risk in these patients. And time, uh, these, uh, MR is uh, uh, dependent on a very, very still patient uh, subject to movement art artifact and often times not obtainable in uh, patients for that reason. Again, uh, an example of an MR with a dyslayer of the distal aorta and runoff. A very nicely showing a totally occluded left superficial artery with uh, the source of collateral channels. And also I think higher uh, resolution of the uh, below the knee vessels. Uh, and another MR example. Uh, once we make the diagnosis and once specifically once we treat Post-intervention surveillance is also important. It's not a one and done. Again, every time that patient comes in, a careful history, a careful physical exam, re repeating the simple non-invasive studies if uh, appropriate in the office, and surveillance with duplex ultrasound, uh, ACCHA guidelines, follow-up studies at one month, six months, and 12 months, and then annually thereafter. Some patient, uh, 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 physicians will also include a three-month follow-up study uh, because depending on the extent of disease and the uh, uh, risk for restenosis once an interventional uh, procedure has taken place. 
CTA is not routinely used for most patients as a surveillance tool unless indicated clinically. Uh, that being said, if we're following patients, as you know, for uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm who's had a uh, endovascular stent graft, we do need to use contrast to assess for the persistence or development of an endovascular leak. So in conclusion, again, I can't stress enough, don't forget the basics, a good history and physical. In those patients who have a high index of suspicion uh, for multiple risk factors, proceed with the simple in-office screening tools, confirm your, your diagnosis in most cases with another simple non-invasive study such as duplex ultrasound, and understand your goals. What do you want to get out of an MRA and CTA if you're going to proceed to that? If diagnosis only is your goal, then careful exam and simple non-invasive studies may be enough uh, to guide your treatment. CTA and MRA in those cases may be uh, unnecessarily and only add cost unless the simple screening tests have been non-diagnostic. If treatment or intervention is your goal, a thorough physical exam, still again, start with the basics. Uh, CTA and MR may be extremely useful for confirming the diagnosis but in patients who have a high index of suspicion or uh, feel have a high chance of an intervention or the need for intervention, it may be more useful simply to proceed directly to invasive angiography and intervention at the same time. Thank you.